Hey, I'm Ron Drodos from KeyboardImprov.com and welcome to our Journey Through the Real Book number 242, which is The Most Beautiful Girl in the World by Rogers and Hart. Not to be confused with the tune of the same title by the musician Prince, who's another one of my favorites, but separate genre. Another nice tune though, it's a beautiful pop ballad. Um, but uh, The Most Beautiful Girl in the World, uh, Rogers and Hart, classic uh, standard from the 30s. And what we're trying to do with all these lessons actually is to uh, understand where they came from, how we can practice them, They're trying to give you some of the sense of the lessons that I would have with someone like Billy Taylor in the 80s or Harold Danko a little later on, well kind of overlapping around the same time, Gr both great teachers who did a lot for me and also bring some of my own experience because this is interesting, this is from a show, from a Broadway show and um, I've have experience playing jazz and Broadway shows. I helped create a show in the early 90s called Swinging on a Star. I got nominated for Best uh, Musical, Tony Award nomination, and I was the assistant musical director. I did some arrangements. And it was all the old great standards with the lyrics by Johnny Burke, like Misty, Pennies from Heaven, Here's That Rainy Day, uh, It Could Happen to You were in there. So you get to know these songwriters and, and lyricists. And Rogers and Hart, um, can you think of any other tune that they wrote that's in the real book? You might not if you, if you haven't really thought about it, but actually Rogers and Hart have, uh, they're one of the most um, included songwriters in the real book. I'd say Steve Swallow, uh, Joe Beam, Wayne Shorter, um, and uh, Rogers and Hart probably the foremost. Um, not much Gershwin for whatever reason, right? Um, uh, they wrote My Funny Valentine, uh, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. Um, uh, what else is in the real book? I Could Write a Book. Uh, is one of theirs. A very, very famous songwriting team. So Richard Rogers, it's interesting, he was the composer and he wrote this tune and then um, uh, many tunes with Lorenz Hart and then they stopped writing together. There's reasons for that, I'm not going to go on now, but basically uh, he found another lyricist that he wanted to work with, Oscar Hammerstein, who had written the, written the lyrics to All the Things You Are, Jerome Kern. So there's circles, small circles of, of people who worked together at that time. And so Rodgers and Hammerstein went on to write the shows The Sound of Music, um, The King and I, uh, lots, of, lots of great shows, Oklahoma, uh, Carousel. And um, it's interesting with Richard Rodgers because he changed his style of songwriting when he started working with um, Oscar Hammerstein. It went, and, and maybe it's because the nature of popular music in America was changing. The stuff he did in the um, 30s and into the 40s with... Um, Lorenz Hart is very much like, like songs, like AABA -A songs, My Funny Valentine. They became a little less like that, more what led to maybe modern show music. It was definitely a big influence on Stephen Sondheim, for instance, the stuff he did with Hammerstein. But this is more of the uh, type of stuff that became jazz standards. He'd occasionally still write a song in the, his older style, like Edelweiss from The Sound of Music, a little older. Maybe my favorite things, too. But uh, a lot of them was a little different, and certainly the piano arrangements he did were different. But uh, that's another, you know, you can check that out on your own if you're interested. But the most beautiful girl in the world straddles these lines, right? And I would encourage you to learn it the original way. It's a jazz waltz. Listen to Sonny Rollins do it. I think it's, what, 1956, if I'm right? That's the uh, version I, I loved hearing when I was starting out. But I would just learn it as a straight waltz. Boom, ching, ching, boom, boom. Diminished chords make so much sense. See? Sort of grand style waltz, lights of octaves, it's sort of like Chopin waltzes, but not with, the, not with exactly all that technique. But that's where this comes from. Picture people waltzing. You know, at this time, Sonny Rollins, those people, they would have waltzed if they went to a wedding. They were playing waltz. They were they were dancing. You know, nowadays it's you know you're not going to waltz at too many weddings these days. At least not not at least the ones I've gone to anymore. But it's it's fun. You're actually doing it. So when you play a waltz, whether it's a Chopin waltz or a piece like this, you have some experience of that physical movement, right? One, two, three. One, two, three. Um, so we can bring that. I'm not. I'm not. A, I I can't really dance myself, but. I, um, I've played for so many dancers, I get some of that. I get some of that. And I have done a little dancing. But um, 
uh, when you work with dancers, you, you pick up some of the physicality. You have to meld with their, their physicality as you're playing. So we can do that by just jazzing it up a little bit. So instead of one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, it becomes that there's not like one jazz waltz pattern we keep throughout it's, it's very flexible it's like you bring the flexibility of a ballad to something that's even more like towards a swing tempo so as a ballad you might go see so you can get you know four beat four notes in two beats and three five and one you know you're stretching the time a little over the steady pulse and on a waltz you can do that too you can do it in 4-4 four, four swing as well, but for some reason, to me, a, a, a jazz waltz seems like it has some of those, the way a ballad would stretch the, the, the beats and compress the beats um, over the steady tempo. It, it, it's similar to, to, to that, I don't, maybe just the way I think about it, but, but, but see, if, see, see if you think of, think of playing a ballad at a medium tempo with a little bit of jazzy rhythms, and that's kind of like a jazz waltz. So ho hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Um, the interesting thing about this is that Richard Rodgers had written so many tunes that were just 8888, you know, AABA, 32 bar, that I think he was going for something else in here. And the tune doesn't always go to the chord you expect. So you have to really play it slowly a lot and listen to it, like in the bridge. One, two, three. Okay, where's it going? Okay, now I'm hearing this pattern. Now it's going somewhere else. Okay, and then that turns minor. You know, and, and just give it a chance to um, sink into your, your psyche and the way you think. A lot of times we just start playing something fast and then we think, oh, you know, I'm not really getting this or my lines aren't going where they think they are. We have to slow things down. So. Um, I'm just going to have some fun with this and, and see where it leads me. Um, I love playing jazz waltzes. Um, Bill Evans is a big proponent of jazz waltzes, but you, you get others as well. And um, here we go. Let's have some fun with it.
You know, it's interesting, re relating to what I just played, there's um, uh, sort of different stylists in jazz, or at least different ways of approaching jazz. Like you can take, um, like a Bill Evans might play a ballad, and it's, it's very much like, um, you know, he's sort of thinking of this phrase and this phrase, and getting into this rhythm. It's very much in a jazz kind of way um, that, um, uh, like, like subtle in a way. It's not, it's not hitting you over the head with the waltz aspect of it. Where someone like Oscar Peterson or you know some of these pianists in the um, the fifties who were playing you know Billy Taylor, Mary McPartland, who were playing in these um, these rooms like the Hickory House, or whatever, with trios. Some of those pianists um, uh, brought a little more of sense of drama to it. You know, like it, you know, it's it's not playing Broadway. They weren't playing on Broadway, but but it brings a sense of drama. You know. <laughs> Bill Evans wouldn't have done those maybe dynamic contrasts and or maybe it's thinking orchestrationally I'm just sort of thinking out loud here different approaches so a lot of that came into what you just heard I'm definitely thinking a little dramatically with this and in the back of my mind I'm at times picturing people dancing in a big ballroom and trying to evoke that a little bit in a jazz way so hopefully that sort of helps you navigate a tune like this um, covered a lot in this about uh, approaches to this so so uh, take the tune just Start learning the chords slowly and, you know, as if you're accompanying someone, just listening to those chords and absorbing it. And that'll go a long way towards helping you eventually improvise on it. It's not by starting out by improvising on it necessarily. Have fun. Uh, good luck with your own playing. If you're interested in taking your playing to a whole new level of fluency, check out my video course. I've got hundreds of jazz lessons for you there. And thanks for joining me here on this journey through the rule book.